the panel three, population aging and the implication for public social, uh, public policy of our conference. Uh, my name is Jun Jin from Department of Sociology at Tsinghua University. Here, we have four professors who will present their latest work on this topic. And they are Professor Catherine Cogney from Chicago, University of Chicago, and also Professor Vinny Ye from Harvard University, and Professor Zhang Yi from Chinese Academ Academy of Social Science, and also uh, Professor Ming Wen from University of Utah. And uh, now each presenter will have 20 minutes to present their talk. And after that, uh, we will open floor for the discussion. So the first presenter is Professor Kathleen Kagany. She is a professor of sociology and also the senior fellow and the director of a population research center at Newark University of Chicago. And uh, Professor Kagany also is the director of University of Chicago Yuan Center in Hong Kong. Now let's welcome Professor Kathleen. Uh, the topic of her talk is social capital and aging. Please, Professor Kathleen. Thank you so much, Dr. Jin, and I'm thrilled to be here today and looking forward to questions and comments from our audience. I'm going to speak about social capital and aging, and I'm going to use an activity space frame and think about social interaction in the context of COVID-19. This is a study based in my hometown of Chicago, but my aim is to bring some of these methods and insights to Hong Kong. And, and in fact, I was supposed to be at the UN campus this evening or <laughs> today um, in Hong Kong uh, to be able to develop a project of this kind. Uh, but I'm, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to interact in this way. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to be, briefly review the underpinnings of research on place, and I'm going to argue for new ways of capturing place that might better align with theory, particularly as it relates to social capital, which is what I'll be discussing as our frame today. I want to note that the capacity to understand the influence of place has changed greatly, and I'm going to ask how these new approaches might have insight into COVID-19. And I was motivated to focus on the COVID-19 aspect of this project uh, because of Dr. Yin's presentation today. So I hope there'll be some nice intersections. Next slide. So I'm in the sociology department. I'm taking a sociological approach to the understanding of the impact of place, thinking about people in and across space in real time, but that we have limitations in the characterizations of that space. We want to understand one's circumference of turf in everyday life. That's certainly important for lots of different outcomes, but, but uh, we could all argue that, that it really matters in the context of COVID-19 and infection rates. So we want to ask whether new methods can provide insight into what place is, how it's perceived, how it matters for health, and potentially how it might be modified for an aging population. Next slide. So what this is, is a much more expansive approach where we move beyond the residential neighborhood. Current approaches may not effectively assess exposure or access to resources. And in fact, residential neighborhood may play a very small part of your daily experience. Arbitrary neighborhood-based boundaries in the United States, we would say census tracts, you know, don't really coincide with how we think about what our neighborhood is. And where and how people spend time may prove more valuable, whether it's your neighborhood or someone else's neighborhood is important to you. And these may really better reflect social capital and the supports that social capital can provide. Next slide. So uh, theoretical approaches have largely uh, neglected the actual spatial exposures beyond this residential address. And so I'm going to just spend a minute or two talking about social disorganization theory. I feel like I have to because I <laughs> come from the University of Chicago, the inception of that theoretical approach. And then I'll talk a little bit about how Jane Jacobs brought new insight. And I'm going to incorporate the conceptualization of these individual level exposures into this notion of activity space and uh, emphasize age and aging in that context. Next slide. 
So here's our sort of simplified schematic where we think about neighborhood structure that affects neighborhood outcomes at either the individual level or this sort of aggregate neighborhood level. We draw on lots of different theory from social science, Casarda on networks uh, as key component of social capital, Rob Sampson on collective efficacy. And I'll just make a note here to say that social capital, of course, refers to a resource potential facilitated by the structure of social networks, where we really think of collective efficacy, the ability of the community to come together for the common good, or to draw on this social capital resource to recognize common interests and achieve specific goals. Next slide. What I'm trying to illustrate in this slide is that we have many important ways to understand this neighborhood structural approach. When, when the other neighborhoods that we think might be influential are contiguous. So they sort of spill over effects. My colleague, Luke Anselin, has come up with some important statistical approaches. But what we don't, what we aren't able to effectively see is that little neighborhood out there in the corner on the right with the question mark. How do we bring in the influence of something that's more distal than the neighborhoods that are proximal to the one that we care about understanding? Next slide. So the way we do that is to integrate both old Chicago school theory from Sean McKay, Burgess, and others that help us think about contextual aspects, structural aspects of community, I should say, segregation, poverty, residential stability, race and ethnic heterogeneity, how those might affect something like the use of local amenities. That's where Jane Jacobs comes in. She wrote Death and Life of Great American Cities. If anyone wants other sites of hers, please contact me via email. She's well known for this notion of eyes on the street, this sense of engagement of older adults in community, let's say as one example, where they're sort of informally monitoring um, and making sure that everyone's safe on the street. Um, but, but she's also known for really this notion of the web of public trust and that something happens, we have expectations for action in, at the community level. And you can sort of see seeds uh, um, that, that are really, um, fertilized by her notions of this web of public trust in contemporary collective efficacy theory. I'm very interested in how all this matters for health. Next slide. That then led us to ask this broader question of the structure of socio-spatial exposure. So again, we took that old neighborhood context theory from the Chicago School, from contemporary elaborations that come from Rob Sampson, um, uh, William Julius Wilson, and Others, my colleague Min Wen um, uh, in our session today has made important contributions to this body of work. What we'd like to do, having learned so much from how people examine neighborhoods and, and the extent to which they affect health, is to, again, be more expansive in how we understand the space that is uh, critical for whether or not people become sick or whether or not they feel healthy, what is that exposure space? So we look at activity space, the set of places individuals come into contact with as a result of their routine exposures. Next slide. This is our wonderful research team. We were funded by the National Institute of Aging. Our project is entitled Activity Space, Social Interaction, and Health Trajectories in Later Life, including uh, colleagues from Ohio State, um, the National Opinion Research Center, Cornell, and then our advisory board, uh, some, some uh, colleagues at Chicago, but also at Michigan, Harvard, and UCLA. Next slide. The specific aims for our project, and we've entitled the specific project, our data collection effort, Chicago Health and Activity Space in Real Time. It's to collect primary multi-wave data from 450 Chicagoans, age 65 and older. We conduct in-person interviews and take biological measures. We use a smartphone app over week-long periods to identify the latitude, longitude, and distance traveled to describe the activity spaces that people inhabit in real time. We also use ecological momentary assessments. So we beat people five times a day on that phone we gave them to carry. And we ask them about how they feel in the moment. It comes from the work at Chicksima High and this idea of flow, and we want to know, um, are they happy? Are they content? I'm going to show you some examples of what those uh, images look like in a moment. And then we use extant information. I won't talk as much about that today, but we, we collect also census data and um, aggregate that. And we also have sensor data from a project called Array of Things to tell us more about neighborhood context. Next slide. We were separately funded by the NSF. The NSF put out a rapid call right when um, the uh, pandemic really began to take hold in the United States, so in March. 
And so we were able to extend this project with additional support from NSF. And what we want to ask is whether lower income, racial and ethnic minorities, and those in economically disadvantaged neighborhoods may exhibit routine patterns of exposure to more crowded, higher risk locations. So we want to understand the context in which COVID takes place. We ask questions of whether there are differences in social environments, activities, and social integration by neighborhood that alters whether or not people are more likely to get COVID. So we can ask whether those in lower income settings engage in leader, leisure activities in free public spaces, might rely on more crowded discount shopping destinations in the absence of neighborhood grocery stores or delivery. Are they more likely to depend on public transit or continue working beyond the typical retirement age, potentially in face-to-face -face or service sector jobs? So again, are, are individuals in lower income spaces inhabiting social roles that put them at risk and, and does the neighborhood that surrounds them contribute to that risk? Next slide. So we, um, for this component of the study assessed during and after the pandemic, we clearly are not to the place where we can ask questions after yet. We thought we would be in that place right now. So I will be showing you the intake survey and GPS tracking data from three shorter waves um, that, that we then are able to compare at least before with our chart data and now with our COVID waves. So we're gonna ask about the COVID experience of self and others, precautions and behaviors, social interactions and compliance, and then also neighborhood perceptions. Next slide. So I, I just wanna tell you a bit about what we know about COVID in the United States and in Chicago in particular. African-Americans and Latinos are at much greater rates of, of um, being infected by COVID. Hospitalization rates are much, much higher. And deaths uh, for African-Americans and Latinos, again, uh, twice as high for African-Americans um, and just a bit higher for Latinos, but it is higher than their white counterparts. And African-Americans over 40% of Chicago deaths, but really only represent 29% of the population. And just to remind you, in the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, uh, fewer years of education and a disadvantaged neighborhood context increased the risk for hospitalization net of clinical risk factors. So we, did, we were able to learn from um, the H1N1 pandemic and that informed the way that we developed our data collection for the COVID waves. And just to remind too that infection and hospitalization rates may be associated with knowledge about transmission, perceived risk of infection, fear associated with infection risk, and that social class and neighborhood conditions can lead to differential capacity to social distance. So if you're living in more crowded quarters, again, if you're shopping in more crowded spaces, if you can't rely on things like home delivery, you are taking a risk every time you're meeting your daily needs. Next slide. This is to quickly show you the components of, the, of our study, both the chart waves and the COVID waves, where we, are, we collect biomeasures, health questions, social environmental questions, and behavior questions. We track people for one week at a time uh, with phones that we send to them. Um, and uh, we're able to both accrue these data in this, this describes our larger scale chart study, and then, uh, but we're using the same structure for the smaller scale COVID study. Next slide. These are the neighborhoods we draw from. There are 10 neighborhoods in Chicago. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Chicago, you could certainly send me an email to get a little more information. But these are neighborhoods we chose purposefully because they vary by race and social class. Next slide. Our EMA approach, uh, we're to do five beeps a day for seven days. And this, this just shows you the window. So we wanted to make sure we had variation over the course of a day. Next slide. We can kind of quickly click through these. We ask about what language. Next slide. Where were you when you were pinged? So this is for the ecological momentary assessment. Again, we did a baseline study. Then we ping people on the phone to get in the moment data collection. At the time of the ping, who were you with? That's the next slide. And then the next slide asks, um, do you feel content? Do you feel energetic? So that's the next slide. And then the next slide, yep, exactly, uh, helps you um, understand, I think, that we've wanted to get people's perceptions of the communities they pa they're passing through. This is particularly important 
when we are thinking about people assessing order and disorder, but we also wanted to, for the sociologists um, as part of this panel and in the audience, wanted to use collective efficacy and social capital theory to think about how people make assessments of community when they're passing through them. So they aren't neighborhoods they live in, but they're neighborhoods they may inhabit in their day-to-day -day lives. So we want to understand the application of that theory to places they're moving through and observations of pro-social activity as well, like uh, people nodding and saying, Hello, next slide. So I'll quickly move through the results. I'm going to show you the results from our pre-COVID waves and then our COVID waves. And again, we don't have post-COVID waves yet, but I want to be able to share since thinking about race and space in particular, since race is such an important component and a risk factor, as I outlined earlier, and who is and who isn't getting COVID. So next slide. This is just to show you these are neighborhoods where we drew sample. I I want to show you here, um, the codes at the top tell you whether they're uh, black, Hispanic, or white neighborhoods, and then the L, M, and H are whether they're low, medium, or high in income level. And one of the things I, I want to illustrate here is that you see that some neighborhoods appear more clustered or constrained than others. Um, some uh, neighborhoods appear that people are really, their orbit is mostly their neighborhood space. If you look at Irving Park, see down in the lower left, um, that's primarily a white neighborhood, and those folks are not moving south very much. And one fact to share about the city of Chicago is it's quite segregated by race. So um, the north side is pretty white, the south side is American, and you see um, partitions in that way. Next slide. Um, so these are our African-American respondents. Next slide. Latino respondents in our next slide are white respondents. And I show race motivated race last panel where we looked at the 10 um, different neighborhoods, but wanted to be able to show you um, that again, it looks like people are operating in very different racialized spaces and that that may have implications, for instance, on many of the social movements um, that we saw this summer in the United States. And um, that's not the intent of this presentation, but I think these sorts of data could bring insight into that sort of social phenomenon. Okay, my next set of slides are showing how people are, are when, when we ping them, where are they? Where are they answering those EMAs or ecological momentary assessments? So next slide. Um, and so I am gonna ask <laughs> my partner here to quickly click through um, slide 38. And I wanna just show you, and you can see some of the respondents are more or less constrained than others as we move through all of these neighborhoods. Is this just to show you where people are pinged and you see that some people are, some in, you know, from the neighborhood they come from, they are more um, circumscribed in their um, responses than in other neighborhoods. Next slide. Great. And this shows you that, so these are, this is sort of some key findings about the, uh, social capital piece, these are patterns of social context and contact, and this is our pre-COVID space where we see all network ties primarily rely on face-to-face -face interaction. Let's focus on these bars where we see very distinct differences by race and ethnic group. We also see very distinct differences by level of education where um, African-Americans and Latinos much more continue face contact and those with lower levels of education. We think this is a motivating finding uh, when we think about how to manage in a COVID space when face-to-face -face kinds of interaction are not possible. Next slide. These are the survey items for precautions taken and the kind of worries due to COVID-19. So I've shown you some pre-COVID data, but those pre-COVID data inform how we're thinking about the analysis of COVID. And I'm gonna wrap this up in just a couple minutes, but I wanna show you some results here. So we asked all the, all the things we, you would imagine, wash hands, um, sanitizing, um, but we also wanted to ask about general worries that come with COVID. Next slide. So these are bivariate correlations, and this is just showing you what I wanna highlight here are that the white respondents seem more worried about getting sick and expect severity of illness as compared to African-Americans and Latinos. And this was surprising to us that, that as people are older, so the older age groups, um, 
took fewer precautions and were less worried about COVID. So we thought that was quite surprising. Next slide. Let's click quickly through here. This just shows you these same patterns that look very similar. This is during the COVID period in how the African-American, Latino, and white respondents move. And, and let's look here. So this is comparing our chart waves with our COVID waves. And one of the things I wanna show you here is that um, you know when people are pinged with those, um, they're out and about, and we figure out where they are with GPS, about half the time during COVID, they're in their home location. Um, and, the, and during COVID, um, about 60% of the time. So they're staying home a, a bit more, but not that much more. Next slide. Um, that is interesting. I'm going to skip this one. <laughs> Keep going. And um, I will skip this too, but I just what, I'm, what I show in these two slides is just to say um, that uh, um, one thing that was fascinating to us is that the lower income uh, persons and, and our African-American Latino respondents seem much more constrained in space during COVID periods of time. So we thought they might need to leave the neighborhood more to get the kinds of things they need, um, but it turns out that um, that it seems that they are more isolated. So let me just summarize quickly, that age was inversely related to both the total number of precautions taken and worries about the pandemic impact. Whites were significantly more likely to have at least some worries about risk and to expect to be hospitalized or worse. Blacks were significantly more likely to not be worried at all about getting sick, but also seemed to experience less difficulty in taking precautions. Respondents stay home a bit more, but not that much more, and that may explain or what be, give us one reason why um, uh, the United States has not been able to keep uh, COVID under control. And I just wanna point out that our black and low income respondents are more constrained in space, as I noted. That's consistent with these pre-COVID waves, but more pronounced during the pandemic period. This could lead to severe social isolation, which is something I think we need to carefully consider. And I'll stop there. Cogni. Uh, a very interesting research, uh, research uh, because that research provides a new re method to, for our to explore the relation between social capital and uh, community ac activity. And also it shed, it shed a light on how the lower income people, the lower income social group, they, uh, what kind of the problem they are facing during the pandemic of COVID-19. And we found out actually social capital probably wouldn't uh, help them as much as we uh, previously thought. So that's, I think, very important funding, yeah, for us to understand the, the social capital, uh, the, the mechanism of social capital, how social capital help us, and also the condition of how social capital could help those uh, marginalize the social groups. It's very interesting uh, and also very fascinating research. Thank you again, Professor uh, Kagani. And then we will move on to the second uh, presentation. That That is uh, Professor Vini Ye from Harvard University. Uh, she is the professor of Department of Global Health and the Population at Harvard T.H. Chen School of Public Health. And also, uh, Professor Ye is the director of China Health Partnership at Harvard University. Now, Professor Vini Ye. Uh, the topic of her presentation is Aging and the Popular and the public health from the lens of COVID-19. Professor, yeah. Thank you. Good morning to our friends and colleagues in Singapore and in China. Um, I wish I could be there with all of you. Um, so in, the, uh, in my talk, I'm going to provide some evidence and also thoughts for um, discussion uh, as relevant to what might want we want to think about the public policies that are relevant to aging um, uh, using COVID-19 as the entree point. Uh, next please. There's no question that with data from China and from around the world that the elderly population suffer much higher 
case fertility and also infection rates from COVID. As you can tell that the elderly has a much higher um, case fertility rate. And so um, this is a, quite a concern for all of us. So the question is, um, given COVID, what, what should we do differently um, for the elderly population? Or is COVID just uh, affecting the elderly and the non-elderly similarly? And the effective intervention has no differences. So before I um, talk about COVID and the elderly population, let me just quickly review what are some of the effective interventions that we have known so far. Next, please. I have to qualify that my talk is going to be drawing on evidence so far. I would keep using that word because COVID is still a moving target. Things are still changing, evolving. And also the my talk is going to be targeted for China, even though I'm going to be drawing on evidence from around the world where they are available. And not all the evidence is comparable. I also have to say that because China experienced COVID much earlier at a time when we have much less evidence and knowledge. And while other countries um, is um, confronting, uh, confronted, confronted with COVID when there's more knowledge, and of course, with vaccine coming along, all these are different. So I just want to have a word of caution when you um, look, listen to what I'm saying. Um, the data, some of them are still preliminary and not all of them are comparable. Let me just quickly summarize what we know so far in terms of what is effective interventions for COVID. And for that matter, I would say it actually applied to largely um, a large number of infectious disease. There's a set of what we call non-pharmaceutical interventions, and it goes from very um, strict interventions like lockdowns. There is some emerging evidence to show that lockdown policies does matter, thus are in effective in reducing transmission rates. And other policies are all surrounding the principle of early detection, early isolation, early quarantine, and early treatment. And to do to be able to do early detection is widespread testing, which China is doing very well, but not in the United States. Then early isolation and quarantine, as we know, at least in China, in the very early days, many of the infections were in fact intra household um, infections. So being able to separate people and that's why later on China build these huge um, stadiums uh, like Fang Chang Hospital is for the purpose of isolating people. And we also know physical distancing matter, the outdoors, and if you're indoors, stay 1.6 to 3 meters apart, and this also has shown to be effective. And wearing masks, even though that is a little bit contentious, depending on whether you're in the US or in Asia. And finally, of course, vaccines. So I'm going to go through um, the rest of my talk thinking about to what extent these effective interventions affect the elderly and the young people differently or not, and therefore how we should be thinking about public health interventions for the elderly for um, situations like COVID. Next, please. The first thing that we need to recognize is that most elderly populations are affected by one or more non-communicable diseases. And in the case of China, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and respiratory diseases have, are now making up the major disease burden. And the majority of elder people would have some sort of hypertension, diabetes, and also another um, uh, challenge is dementia. Next, please. Dementia Alzheimer is rising quite fast in China and it's estimated that by 2030, there will be about 23 to 24 million elderly people living with dementia. And what is the implication of these disease burden? Next, please. Now with um, COVID, we know one consequence is the interruption of routine care. And this happened in China, in the US, it's around the world because a lot of resources have been devoted to acute hospital care and also because to prevent infection, to prevent human-to-human -human interaction. And the service that are affected most by and large is actually primary care and outpatient care. 
And telemedicine has emerged as the substitution for these kind of care. But we also know and have evidence that telemedicine is just not ideal for elderly individuals, and especially for those who live in rural area. I mean, they might have a cell phone, but many of them actually do not know how to navigate the system and not to know that they actually know they can get onto the phone and then try to get care. And in fact, since the beginning of COVID, hospital admission for major health conditions like heart attack and stroke have dropped precip uh, uh, significantly. Data from China shows that uh, admission for stroke dropped by almost 40 to 50 percent. In the United States, the drop is a little bit less, but still it's about 20 percent. And what are some of the reasons? One major reason is that when people have early symptoms of stroke, for example, chest pain, they were so afraid that to go to a hospital or go to emergent care for fear of being infected. And we also know that many hospitals, especially those hospitals that are designated for COVID care, but if you look at the peak of uh, COVID in China or now in the United States, many hospitals are designated as COVID hospitals. They have pretty much shut off any uh, routine outpatient visits, routine care management, and also um, public health education. And so the education for people of um, when to seek care when you have a stroke um, is very much missing. And there's also the lack of proper transportation. It's just uh, these are common factors that we have seen around the world now. And there's also emerging data that shows that during COVID, um, management of chronic condition like managing hypertension, managing blood glucose for diabetes hasn't been doing very well. All these are putting additional costs on the elderly person mainly because they're more likely to be not seeking care and because they are already suffering a higher burden of non-communicable diseases. Next, please. The next burden is actually mental health and dementia. Again, there are studies that are emerging that shows that during COVID, about 30% of the 7% of senior citizens that were being interviewed have symptoms of depression or anxiety. They are more likely to have difficulties of, uh, uh, in sleeping um, compared to younger COVID patients. And many of them are also living a more sort of sedentary life. I mean, similar to what Kathleen was just showing, people just don't go out, don't move around. And there is evidence, I mean, physiological evidence to show that that actually is associated with mental health as well. Now, what is interesting is that I think there's now emerging evidence in many countries that Although mental health, the mental health effect of COVID on the elderly is quite significant or non-trivial, but they're actually smaller compared to younger people. But it doesn't mean that we can ignore that problem though. And there are also emerging evidence to show that the lack of interaction, the elevated anxiety, the um, disruption of things that elderly people are used to doing, and this is not just care, and the things that they have been routinely go doing, for example, in Western society, routinely going to church, routinely going to a social group that they interact with, all those are associated with progression of dementia, not onset, but progression. Next, please. And next comes the challenge is actual behavioral change and information. And this is consistent, somewhat consistent with uh, Kathleen, what Kathleen presented as well. Um, there are studies coming from elderly for elderly in China showing that they are much less likely to make behavioral change um, for their own risk and also to help others preventing risk. And this includes uh, wearing masks. And it's actually a challenge for elderly with dementia to try to understand and to try to really adopt behavioral change. The other challenge is information. Um, there's no question that misinformation and disinformation is a major problem, especially during this COVID, when many people are relying on social media. And how does elderly people really differentiate what is the right information, what is the wrong information has become a challenge. Next, please. So now let me move on to a population which is more those, uh, next please, those that are living in long-term care facilities. Uh, sorry, 
um, uh, let me let me talk about vaccine and treatment first. Um, so what about the, the, the evidence that I have been talking about, the issues that I've been talking about, it's not just for elderly people living in long-term care, it's for the population. And before I talk about the long-term care facility population, let me just talk about vaccine. Now, everyone now is waiting for the right vaccine and treatment, and that's going to be coming to rescue uh, us from COVID. But the effectiveness on vac of vaccine on the elderly population is actually not quite known yet. And there are a lot of hypotheses that um, the effectiveness on a vaccine on elderly people might not be as high. And in fact, there is some um, strategy that is being considered that is instead of vaccinating the elderly people, perhaps it is better to vaccinate the people surrounding the elderly people who actually react to the vaccine better. Um, there are also other biological limitations in terms of the use of therapeutics. For, for example, many elderly have weakened kidney and liver functions, and that makes them makes it risky to um, uh, prescribe antiviral um, um, treatment because like uh, remdesivir, because they react with um, um, drugs that they have taken that remain in the system. And these antivirals also react with uh, others um, non-communicable disease um, medications like beta blocker, etc. Et and so all these are also creating a set of triage rule um, in different countries, I'm not saying in China, in different countries of who gets treated first, who gets the vaccine first, and it raises new ethical implication of what should be the priority given to elder people when it comes to treatment for COVID or in the future, a new pandemic. Next please. So long-term care facilities. There's no question that long-term care facilities are hotbeds of um, infection around the world. Now, China is uh, spared by that because of, um, uh, I think the population living in long-term care facilities in China is still low, number one. Number two is of the very strict isolation policy that is being enforced and imposed. But as you have heard from uh, my previous slides, the implication is that many of them is, yes, they don't get infected or they don't die from infection, but the shutdown and also the social isolation is actually creating problems of depression or progression of Alzheimer. And around the world, there are also some evidence, and there's some evidence in China as well, to show weight loss and malnutrition. Because sometimes old people, they eat they, 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 what prompt them to eat and willing to eat within long-term care facilities is actually triggered by interaction with people they know, triggered by interaction with um, um, uh, certain activities and actions. And, and so that actually has created a problem. And there's no question that the staff in long-term care facilities are actually not quite trained, I would have to say, um, in addition to the fact that they're quite um, themselves are quite strained in terms of their own health care and, and pressure. So before um, I want to now move on in the remaining two minutes, uh, uh, three minutes, I, wa uh, I want to move on to what are some of the football thoughts in terms of um, implication of policy. And before I do that, let me just quickly say, summarize what, I, what is China thinking about in terms of long-term care policy. Next. Um, the Chinese government's goal is that eventually 90% of the population, elderly population, would remain at home and receive formal and informal care at home when needed. 7% will be in the community and 3% in institution. And because right now long-term care is so undeveloped, China is promoting primary sector to come into long-term care in a vigorous way. And at the same time, the government is uh, pilot testing a publicly funded long-term care insurance. So how should we be thinking about public health and long-term care uh, and elderly care in the context of these government current policies? Next, please. Um, my first point is that despite COVID, which is an infectious disease, countries around the world and China need to persist 
to strengthen its primary healthcare system for prevention and management of chronic conditions. In, in doing so, it will reduce the risk of elderly people getting sick or die from COVID or COVID-like uh, infection. Second, I think that country, different countries and China should really spend time, uh, spend its effort to develop and strengthen primary care and community-based care as the point of contact that people trust to go to during times like COVID for information, for guidance, and for triage. I don't think it is too early to start thinking about how do we develop and routinize the use of technology, including telehealth, including using exoskeletal device, including developing games to help elderly people maintain their cognitive function, during time of um, human uh, lack of human interaction. And it is important to do these things during non-crisis time so that when crises come, they're more prepared. Staff training needs to incorporate more psychological um, training for the caring the elderly and also how to use technology. I perfectly agree with Kathleen that also for ourselves in public health, we need to take a much broader view in terms of public health, and that is we have to get away from a traditional thinking of public health to incorporate other disciplines to public health planning. And that includes urban planning that would allow multi-generational residents in the same community. That includes designing long-term care facilities that still allow space, outdoor interaction, safe interaction. And um, I also think that it calls for um, multidisciplinary research and thinking of what are ethical rationale, rationing of limited resources for elderly. And finally, in particular in the case of China, where talking about death is such a taboo, it's time to try to get the different um, stakeholders, government, societies, families and the elderly themselves to have healthy discussion of what would the elderly elderly person of the meaning of end of life decision and discussion. Thank you very much for this opportunity um, to share my thoughts and I look forward to interacting with other panelists. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Ye. Uh, Professor Ye provides uh, a very detailed uh, study on how the pandemic could influence the elderly people. And uh, from this presentation, we know even if the elderly group, they are safe from the infection of the COVID-19, but they also suffer from the pandemic due to the other mechanisms, such as uh, the shutdown, uh, the isolation from the shut down and also professor Ye provides a detailed suggestions and uh, policy recommendations to improve the elderly population and especially for the long-term care for the elderly uh, population i think that's very thoughtful very insightful okay thanks again for this uh, very important presentation from professor Ye. Next, uh, we will welcome Professor Zhang Yi. Uh, he is from the National Institute of Social Development, 8 Chinese Academy of Social Science. Professor Zhang's presentation, the topic is the aging of China's population in future years. Professor Zhang. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chen. And, uh, the last uh, night, uh, I changed my uh, topic and put uh, some another uh, country such as in uh, Japan and uh, Korea. I like to be, do some comparison work between these two countries and say that uh, population getting aging and aging is a process of uh, modernization. So, I like to do this kind of work and have a brief introduction to all of our scholars and understand more about Asians 
because of the European countries, most of the the sub about uh, the, the aging and the, the aging uh, process led the lack of the workers, uh, such as in uh, West uh, European countries, and they import much more uh, labor forces from uh, East European countries to deal with their uh, lack of labor forces. But in China and in Japan and in Korea, uh, I think they have not this kind of the measures. So I, I want to talk about this topic. Next, please. Next, yes, uh, this is uh, Japan's uh, population trends and uh, the aging population, the working population, and uh, the children population. From here, we can find uh, a very important trend. Uh, uh, the working population becoming uh, lower and lower and the aging population becoming higher and higher and in the year 2019, uh, 20, we find that the aging uh, rate is getting to 29 or so and uh, we find that uh, uh, Japan is an aging country and uh, they are uh, social development and uh, the economic de uh, development uh, is getting uh, lower and lower and in the last year maybe GDP increased with just uh, one percent or so and this year maybe they have a very lower and the uh, shock their GDP uh, increase rates so uh, in the near future we find that uh, the, their working population shrink dramatically uh, in uh, next uh, 20 years or 30 years. So it is very important, uh, very serious uh, aging uh, chance. Next, please. And uh, from here, we can find that using, uh, in the year 1950, the population pyramid is a very classic pyramid. The children population is much more large and the working population is okay they can support their aging population to life and they can uh, spring uh, they can take their children uh, get much more uh, enjoy much more better life and it is okay for them to develop their uh, economy and uh, their uh, social uh, development aspects and uh, in the year 2007 we find that the population should shrink dramatically because of uh, in, after 1990s, uh, the, the, the GDP decreased the fast and the population decreased the fast too. And uh, you will find that, uh, the working population still is larger, but the uh, children population getting lower and lower. And uh, from projection of Japanese scholars and their government, we find that this is a very, very aging population style. The aging population getting much more large and the working population shrank. And from 65% uh, uh, to 51% also in the year 2050. And I think it's just a projection. Maybe in the near future, a Japanese government we encourage their people have much more babies. But up to now, th these trends have not given us much more, uh, in, uh, much more in impactors to all of the society and uh, to all of their uh, economic uh, sectors. So I think if uh, their children population should drop to 10% also, maybe uh, uh, their social development style will be changed so much. So modernization late the Japan uh, uh, social organization and their family structure and their lifestyle change so much. Next, please. And uh, from here, uh, we, we will find that uh, the population from here is much more uh, important uh, uh, data. We can find uh, their trends clearly. And uh, this is the, the, the mean age getting aging and aging and the median age getting aging and aging it is a dependence rate 
uh, Rachel, we found uh, the old age getting aging, aging, and uh, the end of children, Rachel, is very heavy for their uh, social development and economic development. So maybe in the near future, Chinese is going to be uh, getting much more money, getting much more uh, foreigners to support the family uh, sectors and encourage family sectors how much more babies and then let their uh, aging population trends uh, uh, decrease their burdens. So I think aging trends in Japan is very serious. And uh, uh, if uh, our uh, Asian countries uh, from this picture have no some lessons, maybe in the near future, the Korea and the China may have the, the, the same uh, routine uh, development trajectory. So next, please. And uh, this is the size of uh, household in Japan. And we can uh, private household, uh, one person's household, uh, getting higher and higher. And in the year of 2000, 27% of them uh, lived in uh, one person's home or household. And the last year, maybe 30, 37 uh, of them uh, lived in uh, one person's uh, household. And uh, uh, some people say that uh, in recent years, Japanese uh, population have no marriage uh, in print rates. So uh, uh, maybe single society may be produced uh, by this kind of modernization. And from here, we can find one person's household, even in ordinary households, uh, we will find one person's uh, living in household getting higher and higher. And the United States, maybe in the big cities and in uh, European countries, in the big cities, one person's household is getting higher and higher in, in this kind of the trends. I mean, it is the same thing uh, uh, within modernization. We will uh, uh, enjoy this, this kind of uh, life. But uh, uh, if one person's household uh, getting higher, uh, the, the babies cannot easily produce it to our society. Next, please. And uh, this is a current population pyramid. We will find it is it, it, the same thing because if they have uh, this kind of the pyramid uh, state, but after they getting much more rich and uh, the monetization, late Korean people uh, have no babies. You, you find that the, the, their babies getting uh, lower and lower, and the children population uh, getting smaller and smaller. So the, this this kind of the population pyramid, I think, uh, if our science sector cannot help us, maybe uh, in the near future, we will face very heavy burden to aging population's development. So if we, uh, if our uh, working, uh, uh, sort of, uh, working forces or working laborers get much more large, it's easy for us to develop. It. If the working population get much more smaller, maybe in the future, uh, the development the speed be getting uh, down and down. Next, please. And then in the future, it's the future's population imagination. And uh, here is the 2010, this is 2030, and this is 2050. Uh, it is the same thing. Because of the Japan's population stress is, is so, and the Korea's population imagination is like this, and uh, maybe in the future, uh, in East Asian countries, in the main East Asian countries, we will face serious aging process. Next, please. And it's uh, Korea's population trajectory uh, in the year of 2015, uh, they, they're getting top point, and uh, they will, uh, this, this kind of the stage is not much okay. But after that, maybe after 2030, the total population will get into double. And uh, in the near future, maybe the population 
uh, total population is getting lower and lower to uh, the Korean. So uh, it is the same thing for you know, uh, the imagination of the Japan. So the Korean have the same love to uh, with Japan if we can do some comparing the work. So Koreans and the Japan is the same thing. Next, please. So their total fertility rate is just uh, 1.2. It's the lowest uh, TFR in uh, in the world, maybe since 2009. Uh, South Korea has improved its record for having the world's lowest birth rate. However, the birth rate still remains low, and, and if this continues, the population is a uh, expected to decrease by 30% to 42 million in 2050 and the extinction by uh, 2750 uh, is, is an impossibility. So, but it, it cannot a reality because, you know, uh, if the population getting low and low, and maybe the, the children population will be needed by our society and uh, the government will encourage the young uh, couples to have much more babies. So up to now, this kind of the trends have not been changed, but uh, uh, after uh, 2050, maybe most of the finance will be, uh, will be given to uh, family sectors to encourage people to have much more babies. Uh, the country's birth rate is currently just uh, 1.2 children per mother is TFR. One of the lowest in the world that is only like than birth rates in, uh, in the province of Taiwan, of China, Singapore, Macau of China, and Hong Kong of China. So here is a very important chance for us to uh, judgment our future's uh, population trajectory. Next, please. And uh, after now, we, we need to discuss about the China's population pyramid. Uh, in last year, we will find it's the same thing. And uh, uh, in the year 2000, uh, in the year of 1990, maybe the population uh, pyramid is much more okay. But after that, the children population shrank dramatically. And in our days, Chinese government uh, reform our uh, population policy and uh, they encourage couples have two uh, babies and it is meaning from one couple, uh, one child to uh, one couple, two children. But up to now, some of them lost their desire to have many more uh, babies. So this, uh, the, the, the uh, policy uh, TFR is much more higher, but actually the, the TFR is much more lower. And uh, in, in the first day of last month, Chinese host their uh, seventh population sensors, maybe in next uh, uh, three months or five months later, the population data will be published uh, up to now. Most of the uh, scholars said that maybe uh, the, the baby uh, or the, the, the children population will still shrink much more longer time. Next, please. And this is the population trajectory of China. It is the same thing. The, the Japanese get into Dao and the Korean get in Dao and the, in China, maybe in the year of 2027 in the year. Uh, the population we uh, face their top point. And uh, in recent years, some of the scholars said that uh, maybe after five years late, the top point, point will come, and after that, uh, we're getting lower and lower. So this is the trend. So this trend, most of the scholars think that after 2030 years or also, maybe Chinese population will get lower and lower. And the uh, India's population will get higher, and uh, after that, India will be first population country. 
and China will be second biggest population country after the year 2030 or so. Next, please. And this is the uh, different stages population pyramid. This is 2010, 2030, and 2050. So from here, we can find that uh, in China, if modernization uh, maintain and uh, if the children population uh, continues to wreck uh, in the year 2050, uh, the working population may be very smaller and uh, the children population is much more uh, smaller. So the aging population is much more uh, bigger. And uh, uh, in recent years, we have put some projections about the children, uh, the, 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 the Chinese population. Uh, uh, ex, uh, the life ex, uh, expectancy, uh, maybe in the year 2050, uh, the life ex, expectancy will be uh, 91 years old. Uh, so uh, I think uh, in China, in the year 2050, the aging population will account for 33% also. So it's very heavy for us uh, to support our modernization. So in recent years, we uh, need to develop the fast. If we uh, mistake this kind of, uh, if we uh, make some mistake, uh, maybe uh, after 10 years or 20 years, uh, the GDP uh, decreased the rate, we're getting lower and lower. So we, we face much more serious aging problems. Next, please. And this is GDP per capita in East Asian countries. We find the, uh, in the, this is uh, China's uh, just uh, 10,000 US dollars also, and it's Japan's uh, 40,000 US dollars also, and the Korean uh, 30,000 US dollars also. It, 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 this is difference. So maybe China needs to develop fast. Next, please. Ah, this is the increased rate of GDP. China is much more higher uh, than Japan and uh, uh, Korean. So we needed to develop fast because if you know, uh, China is still a uh, biggest developing country. Uh, if we uh, have not this kind of the chance, maybe in the near future, we cannot uh, deal with our uh, population problems. Next, please. And the service sector increased rates in China. Uh, you will find that uh, in recent years, uh, the industrial structure changed so much. Uh, in the tertiary uh, sector, uh, most of the working forces moved to the, the third sectors, and uh, in the uh, second sectors, it's much more small. And uh, some of the uh, farmers. They, they, they began to move to the cities, becoming market workers. Up to now, we have 250 million market workers moved from uh, rural areas to cities to work. So they, they, uh, they, they, they increased our uh, development uh, speed. Next, please. And the aging speed in Asian country, you'll find it's much more. Uh, then we speed up uh, population aging speed. Next, please. And a brief, uh, brief summary. As aging has reduced the economic growth rate, it's the true. Some of the scholars say that aging, uh, we have some high factors uh, to let economic growth get much more uh, quickly but most of the uh, scholars don't think so. Uh, decreasing economic growth rate slows down the speed of social mobility. So if we have no social mobility, if the farm workers cannot move from countryside to the cities, their situation, their life situation cannot be changed. Uh, so, uh, you know, in recent years, it is okay for our society. But in, in the, uh, after, the 2030, we need to develop our science sector and let the science uh, help us develop very quickly. 
the reduction of social mobility rate will lead to social uh, solidity, uh, solidification. Because, you know, uh, if social mobility is okay, uh, the social harmony is much more good. If social mobility have, have a shrek, maybe uh, social uh, uh, harmony society cannot be maintained. So we need to develop and adjust our social structure and let the social uh, GDP decrease very fast uh, for us. Uh, solely defy the society will reduce the opportunity of social development and uh, uh, which will lead to uh, some social risks. You know, the, if we control social risks, we develop fast. If we cannot control social risks, we, we, develop, we, we, we face some development uh, uh, difficulties. This is my uh, 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 introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you for you sharing my researches. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Professor Zhang Yi. Uh, Professor Zhang provided a broader picture about uh, aging trend in East Asia. Uh, uh, South Korea, Japan, and China, these three countries, they even if they have uh, different size of a population and also different stage of economic development. Professor Zhang tells us all the three countries actually have the same trend of a population aging. And also uh, based on this analysis, Professor Zhang warned us about the future of China if we cannot somehow uh, turn around of this aging trend. The China probably, probably will face the decrease of economic growth and also uh, the possibility of social unrest. A uh, very insightful presentation. And thanks, Professor Zhang. And uh, our uh, final panelist is Professor Ming Wen. Professor Wen is the chair of the Department of Sociology at the University of Utah. Uh, her presentation's title is Living Arrangements and Health Aging in China. Professor Wen, please. Thank you very much. It's really great to be here, and I really enjoyed listening to the past uh, three presentations and looking forward to the discussion after my presentation. So um, this is a collect collective, um, a collaborative work with my colleague, Dr. Danan Gu. And in this talk, uh, I'm going to focus on living arrangements and healthy aging in China. Next uh, slide, please. I'll first briefly go over some socio-economic uh, socio and demographic background information and then focus on three topics, living arrangement patterns and trends, disability patterns and trends, living arrangements and health, and then conclude by a brief discussion. Next slide, please. So in the past 40 years, China has been experiencing rapid social economic, demographic, and cultural transformations during the post Mao research uh, reform and opening era. So Chinese people have become better educated, much richer, but also seeing more unequal income and wealth distribution and larger rural urban gaps. So demographically, China has been seeing low fertility, increased life expectancy, fast aging, and large-scale rural to urban migration. And also some value shifts towards greater appreciation for autonomy and independence, and also declining authority within, uh, of the older generation within the household. So all of these forces affect household compositions in terms of both actual and preferred living arrangements. Next slide, please. So according to the 2010 census, which is the most recent census where data are available, there are 178 million older Chinese population aged 60 or older. About 
million of them are migrants themselves. There are 157 million that, who can be called the young old, aged 60 to 79 years, and about 21 million who can be called the oldest old, who are aged 80 or over. So generally speaking, the, the vast majority of the young old Chinese people are in good, generally good health with good functional limit, uh, um, functional status. But the prevalence of various health conditions among the oldest old are pretty high. As um, we can imagine, the oldest old require high levels of support, which is often facilitated through co-residence with children and or grandchildren. But the prevalence rate of living independently, either living alone or, uh, or living with spouse alone, um, is increasing. And many of them require um, lots of social services in terms of home care, community care, institutional care, and so on. Next, please. So living arrangements are complex and have diversified compositions. There are many high level, uh, multi-level determinants in ranging from cultural, demographic, to social economic and health factors. In an important way, co-residence with children stems from the Confucian ideal of filial piety, or xiao in Chinese language. So filial piety means to be good to one's parents, to take care of one's parents. It means not only carrying out duties towards serving parents, but doing so with the proper attitude. Confucius taught that filial piety was among the highest virtue of all. Sometimes practical reasons triggered by the younger generation or young parents are also important in determining living arrangements, especially when they need child, help, uh, child care uh, support from the older parents. So reflecting rational decision making process. So I think it's fair to say that in general, Chinese, a Chinese family tend to act altruistically, not always prioritizing uh, personal joy, personal pleasure or freedom. So in the current research of linear arrangement and healthy aging in China, most of the people have used the data from census. So 100% census data or mini census, 1% of census data. And in the, in the past 10 to 20 years or so, um, several high quality national surveys have emerged. So for example, Chinese Longitudinal Healthy Longevity Survey um, is one of the best or most valuable sources of data that many uh, scholars have used to study living arrangements and health in China. And one unique feature of this data is that the quality of data uh, has been assessed more extensively or more frequently uh, compared to other national surveys. Next, please. So these figures show the temporal trends in living arrangements among uh, old, uh, Chinese older adults aged 65 or older from three sources, 100% uh, census tabulations um, colored in red, uh, pinkish, and um, a mini census data colored in green and mini census tabulations colored in blue. So uh, generally speaking, the trends in living alone, living with others, living uh, in institutionalized arrangements are converging very well. But in terms of living with spouse only and living with children, um, the census 100% tabulations show lower prevalence for living with spouse only and higher prevalence for living with children. So living with children, we also generally call it co-residence uh, rate. And census 100% tabulations can be viewed as gold standard in these analysis. Generally speaking, um, the trends are stable for living alone, living with others, institutionalized living arrangements, and um, upward trends for living with spouse only, and downward trend um, for living with children. Next, please. So according to um, the 2010 census, 
approximately 63% of older Chinese population aged 65 or older are living with offspring. So grouping all sorts of uh, subgroups together, living with children, grandchildren and or um, together 65. So co-residence rate is 65, uh, 63%. And approximately 12% of seniors in China live alone and 23% living with spouse only. And grouping um, living with others and institutionalized living arrangements is approximately 2.5%. Next, please. So just to put in the, the absolute numbers here, sometimes absolute numbers are even more telling of the real situation. 75 million older Chinese aged 65 or older um, are living with offspring. 27 million are living um, with spouse only, and 14 million are living alone. Next, please. So the research on living arrangements is important because living arrangements um, determine largely a person's social roles, social interactions, social support, affecting many very important aspects of later life quality. And um, here are the five commonly studied living arrangements. Living alone, living with spouse only, living with offspring, living with others, living, with, uh, living in institutions. Actually, living alone is relatively less studied because it is a relatively new phenomena. And living with offspring is the most frequently studied because it, is, it represents the most traditional living arrangement. There are also emerging living arrangements, such as living with children who are also 65 years old, so representing the elderly, exclusively elderly, elderly uh, households. That's part of living with offspring, but it's a, it's a, a special group of them and it's under-researched. And generation skipping households, that's also part of living with offspring category, but also a newly emerging and increasingly prevalent living arrangement. Next, please. So in the new analysis, here we ask three questions. What are the temporal trends in disability among older adults in China? How are living arrangements associated with activities of daily living, or ADL, and instrumental activities of daily living, or IADL prevalence among older adults in China? And how are living arrangement transitions associated with ADL and IADL incidents among older adults in China? Next, please. So quite some research has been done to examine the disability trends among older adults in China, but mostly prior to 2010 or 2008, as far as, as we know. In terms of ADL disability trends, um, most of the studies found a downward trend, um, like for example, from 1992 to 2008, but mixed or inconclusive trends for other measures of disability. Next, please. We used the data from the Chinese Longitudinal Healthy Longevity Survey, and we focus on the most recent six waves, starting from 2002, um, ending in 2018. So this survey um, actually initiated um, in 1998. So the first the two waves, 1998 and 2000, were only um, focused on the oldest old. And starting from 2002, um, they also recruited the young old into the study. And we also focused on three, uh, five transitions um, among the six waves. And disability is measured by both ADL and IADL in this analysis. Next, please. We performed um, logistic regressions and our modeling strategies included four models for each outcome with, a, with model one being the most uh, simple model and model four, including the greatest numbers of covariates. Next, please. So these are sample distributions. Um, so for the young old, um, there are slightly more men than women. For the oldest old, there are more women than men. And proportionally speaking, there are more, um, uh, the oldest old 
participants in this study than the young old because of the nature of the beginning, um, the original study design. Next, please. So uh, in addition to, to uh, keeping the, the commonly studied categories of living arrangements, which include living alone, living with spouse only, living with others, institutionalized, we also further categorized the living with offspring category into three subgroups. So living with children, um, not grandchildren, this is a two generation households, which will imp uh, include uh, some of the elderly only households. So older parents, um, adult, and also elderly children. And living with grandchildren um, or great-grandchildren, but not the middle generation. So this would be the generation skipping households. And also the, the most traditional and um, like most frequently studied living arrangements, living with children and grandchildren with or without uh, great-grandchildren. Great so um, among the young old, um, it seems living with spouse only is the um, most frequent uh, living arrangement. And among the oldest old, uh, li living in the three generation plus households is the most uh, prevalent uh, living arrangements. Uh, next, please. So uh, these figures show disability trends based on age standardized um, ADL and IADL disability prevalence. So consistent with previous findings, um, our data also show a downward trend prior to 2008, but then curvilinear relationship um, in, over time after 2008. So increasing from 2008 to 2011 and increasing a little bit more uh, to 2014 and then decreasing um, from 2014 to 2018. And in terms of IADL, the trends are pretty stable, except for the last um, survey showing a little bit upward trend. Next, please. So these results are from a series of cross-sectional analysis based on logistic regression modeling of ADL disability on living arrangements. So we performed these analysis for each of the six waves represented by colored dots. The reference group is a, a three generation plus uh, households, which is again, the most traditional and most frequent living arrangement. So compared to the reference, living alone is linked with the uh, lower odds of disability. And living with others and living in institutionalized living arrangements are associated with the worst ADL disability. So among the three, uh, oh, and living with spouse only, it's almost identical to the reference group. There's barely any difference across uh, young old and oldest old. And in terms of um, living with offspring, so living with children only shows a little bit um, uh, like a worse disability among the young old, but the effect size becomes greater among the oldest old. So if anything, living with children only without grandchildren is linked with higher level or higher odds of ADL disability compared to the three generation plus households. And living in skipped generation households represented by living with grandchildren um, or great grandchildren. So in, the, in, the, in all the samples, there's no difference, but um, it seems like it, it's linked to lower level of disability among the young old. And among the oldest old, the effect is um, uh, minimal. Next, please. So IADL um, patterns are very similar to a, um, ADL patterns, except that uh, generally speaking, the effect size are, are smaller. And another thing among these two slides is that the general trends across time are pretty similar, except for the last two uh, living arrangements. Next, please. So uh, these are um, representing the results from living arrangements transition and IADL incidents. So we only included people who are free of IADL in the previous survey. 
and then looking at their uh, whether the odds of developing ADL incidents in the next survey. Again, we perform the same analysis for each of the transition. And um, we can just focus on model four because um, we showed all of the results from all four models to, to indicate actually including covariates or not didn't really affect any of the, uh, of the results. So looking at model four results, um, transition from living alone to living with fam family versus living alone in both waves um, is linked to worse disability. The same thing for living the transition from living with spouse to living with family versus living with spouse in both waves. By contrast, transition from living with family to living alone versus living with family in both waves and the transition from living with family to living with spouse versus living with family in both waves are associated with better disability odds. So generally, um, in other words, um, it's moving towards dependence, moving towards living with family um, seems to be linked with worse disability and moving away from dependence toward independence seem to be linked with um, better functional status. Next, please. So again, IADL patterns are largely similar to, I, uh, to ADL patterns, except for that the effect size are smaller. Next, please. So these are uh, just the summarize. Um, I'll skip this one. We can come back to uh, for further discussion. Next, please. So um, in, in uh, generally speaking, co-residents with offspring will likely continue to decline while living alone and living with spouse will likely continue to grow. And disability prevalence may increase or decrease over time um, because it's affected by many factors. More research is needed to study emerging living arrangements, um, such as the, the two I, I mentioned earlier, and under-researched outcomes, such as cognitive health. And more research is needed to examine many more factors of healthy, active, active successful aging and among these, I would say community um, environments are one of the most important things, but under-researched in, uh, in Chinese settings. Next one. So this is the last slide. Um, so basically, um, the, this slide shows the results of self-perceived needs for social services. The percentage of answering, yes, I need this service, that's that service, are all pretty high. And there's a slight trend, as you can see here, that co-residence with children or grandchildren seems to be linked to a slightly lower um, percentages of meeting for these uh, social services. Okay, next one. Thank you, that's all. Okay, thank you, Professor Wen. Uh, Professor Wen provides a very detailed uh, picture about uh, how the change, historical change of the population, the, the old generation in China uh, about uh, the disability, disability and uh, their living arrangement. And also, uh, I think from this research, we could find out the importance of social service in the future for the elderly Chinese, especially for the oldest uh, old of the uh, Chinese population. And thanks again for this very uh, detailed uh, data-based uh, research uh, from Professor Wen. Uh, actually, we already had uh, a lot of questions poured in during those wonderful presentations. Uh, the first question comes from Professor Bort Hoffman. Uh, it's arrived probably 40 minutes ago for the question. <laughs> that, yeah, that question is for Professor uh, Cagney. Uh, I will read this question. Uh, have you done policy experiments in your charts study? For example, through healthcare messages, provision of incentives to promote desired behavior or mobility. 
Yeah, that's so a good question. That's a great Thank you. That's a great question. And actually something we're talking about right now. Could we engage in some intervention studies with the use of the ecological momentary assessment techniques? Could you insert reminders? Could, are there other ways in which we could think about, um, you know, I would say interventions related to um, you know, clinical encounters that would right, be mindful of health, but also social encounters that are mindful of health too, but are would address issues more like social isolation. So it's something we're talking about right now. To our knowledge, we haven't seen another study like this that combines the geographic tracking with the EMA, with the biological. And so um, we do think we're now, now that we've sort of moved through all these processes and gotten uh, protocols in order, we do think we're now poised to be able to um, make, we hope, some contributions in the policy realm. Okay. Uh, uh, there is another question for Professor Cogni. Uh, that is uh, in your presentation. Oh, uh, that question is from, uh, yeah, because the, the character is too small. I have to focus on. Okay. Uh, the, the question is from Tian Yuan Kuang. Uh, the question is, in your presentation, you have discussed the race and the income group significantly impact to the activity space. Especially the black and the low income people are more constrained. My question is that by your neighborhood selection, do you control the infra infrastructure's difference among them, including the structure of a building, for example, flat, apartment, a landed horse, horse and the public transportation. Well, oh, uh, I couldn't see all the pictures. Okay, I don't know what happened, but I will continue to read the question. Uh, okay, great. The, yeah, the public transportation, for example, bus, taxi, train. So I wonder the physical condition of the living place. Mm -hmm. Is it crowded or is it convenient? Uh, if that condition matter to the result? Yeah, that's the question. Professor, um, I completely agree that that would matter for the result. I, we haven't looked at that in detail, but we do have data about the physical infrastructure of the neighborhoods. And so we will be able to turn to that. I will say though, that, that those indicators like crowding, like infrastructure and quality of buildings, like access to transportation are correlated with lots of other kinds of socioeconomic conditions in the neighborhood. So I think it would augment what we're already looking at in terms of aggregate levels of poverty and affluence, for instance. I think they play a role, but I think but a symptom of a larger kind of issue related to social and physical isolation for neighborhoods that are under-resourced. Okay. Okay. Uh, because I can see the the picture, the I, I can see the video of all our panelists. So I just uh, starting it's a black box, but I could still oh, could no. read the question. <laughs> yeah, I, I could still read the questions. Okay, there is uh, one question for Professor Ming Wen. That is the relationship. Uh, that that is from Aline Wang. The question is the really okay. The picture is back. That's great. Yeah. Uh, the question for Professor Wen, that is the relationship between living arrangements and the ADL. IADL. Is this the relationship just a statistical correlation rather than a causal relationship? For example, those who become old and fragile will tend to live with or move back to live with their children or grandchildren. That is the question. Yeah, this is a really good question. And the answer is um, absolutely uh, yes. These are not causal effects, um, but these are relation, like correlations or associations, which would hopefully include some causal effects, but I'm sure 
it also includes reverse causation because um, previous studies have also shown that some of the living arrangement transitions are triggered by health needs of the older parents. It's extremely difficult to really sort out causality in living arrangement and health research. But using longitudinal data is one of the ways um, that probably we can get a little bit closer to causality. But I would personally want to see more qualitative or actually mixed methods research that can cross validate mm -hmm. of these results. Okay. Thanks, Professor Wen. Uh, there's another question, I think that is for Professor Wen and as well as Professor Ye, that's uh, related to both of uh, their presentations. That question is uh, concerning how tradition and the culture cultural norm affect living arrangement for elderly. Because assuming that in Chinese culture setting, elderly sometimes feel ashamed for not living with their children. Probably if they mm -hmm. are uh, their son or grandsons, even if they live with their daughter, that could be a public shame or social ashamed thing to do. So the question is, is that possible to reduce their ability to be active physically and manually? Whether uh, or how should the public policy respond to such a phenomena? I think that question especially matters to Professor Ye's uh, presentation because Professor Ye uh, tells us the long-term care facility, the importance of long-term care facilities in uh, fast aging society. So the culture, the, the Chinese culture tradition, for example, uh, we saw that the filial piety, the xiao, could play a role to influence the elderly they are well willingness to live in those long-term care facilities. So I think that that question is both for Professor Wen and the Professor Ye. Professors? Uh, go ahead, you go. Oh, okay, I can just uh, make some brief comments. So my last slide actually shows the perceived needs of social services. And that's actually an important angle, probably for the society and the government um, to start thinking about how to tackle these problems. So we encourage people, older people to age in place, basically living independently as long as possible and, and age in their own home. But meanwhile, living in, like prevalence of living independently, meaning like living alone or living with spouse only without children, is increasing. So these people, especially among the oldest old, probably will need some sort of help. As far as I know, and anecdotally, almost every single um, oldest old person I know in China is using some some sort of um, domestic help help services, and um, and many of them are actually expressing concerns about lacking possibilities of resources. So I would say community services um, is a, a very important possible important um, platform or venue for, for the society to provide um, services. It can be from top down, like from the government, maybe the government policy can um, can be, can be uh, changed or adjusted towards that, allocating some resources uh, while encouraging private sector, as, as uh, Professor Im uh, mentioned, you know, but meanwhile, like, you know, to, to work with private sector, also work with older people, asking them what kind of uh, urgently needed services uh, they, it mo might be most helpful, like for them to stay in their home, not living uh, in, in nursing home or senior centers. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, uh, So I want, to, right. I want to clarify that um, my uh, presentation, um, I didn't mean to convey that it is important to build long-term care facilities or that's where old people should live in. I was just saying that under COVID, the population living in long-term mm -hmm. care facilities okay. need to be looked at differently than those who live in communities. Um, as uh, the, I mean, as I said, the Chinese government's policy is that 
eventually they would hope that 60 percent i'm sorry 90 percent of the elderly population will live at home and seven percent community only three percent institutionalized mm -hmm. and then the question is that if they live at home the question is um i mean the idea of whether it is shame or not shame to live with uh, children or not children um i'm afraid that um very soon it may not be a choice because of rapid labor mobility the previous one child policy and if you look at i mean i'd be actually very interested to see professor one's data um separated by urban and rural population my sense is that the rural population is actually aging faster in the sense that they're more likely to be living alone so under those circumstances of course there is a great need to think about how do you still get care to them while they still live at home? And so right now, China is developing long-term care insurance and it becomes critical as to what services and long-term care insurance is not for facility-based services. It also includes home care, home visits. Mm -hmm. The question mm -hmm. is what should be incorporated? What should be financed okay, by these insurance? But on the delivery side, I think human resource at this moment is the major issue. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people don't feel that being a providing social service um, is attractive. It's socially, um, it's a socially attractive profession, right? Everybody wants to be a doctor. Everybody wants to be a, a medical profession, and and these care um, workers is doing major thing, uh, 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 contribution to society, um, and the kind of training that needs to go in the kind of incentive, the kind of professional um, uh, growth, career pathway, all needs to be developed in order to create that workforce. It is not just about training. You can train people, but people don't want to go into that profession. Exactly. Um, how do you train them? In a way that they understand the psychology. It is not just feeding people. It's not just buying them things. I think huge challenge. But I think COVID provide the impetus for people to think mm -hmm. differently. Okay, uh, thanks, Professor Ye, uh, especially for your clever, uh, cl collaboration about uh, your main point. And also, I think uh, I uh, have some similar uh, thought along the line of your presentation. That is the importance of the the provider of those. Uh, long-term care services because uh, in China the government actually I think especially the central government as well as some of the uh, local government at the most developed areas of China I, they purchase the social services from the uh, social work institutes or social work agencies to provide uh, the services for the elderly people but the problem is uh, this kind of the services, the social workers, uh, they cannot treat the social work as a decent job, a long time stable job. So their services is very important, is very crucial to the well being of the community, especially for the elderly residents. But those social workers, their welfare actually is not guaranteed by the government. And uh, I think that's also the problem, not only about the services, also the facilities, but also for the career, the institutionalized career for those social workers to provide this kind of the services. Okay, that's uh, uh, my thought on this question. And I also, there, yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay. I just want to respond to one thing. Um, mm -hmm. I think it is important to develop social service provider as mm -hmm. a career, as formerly a profession, but does it have to be financed by the government? Does, oh, do, okay. do, is it necessary to make them civil servants? I think mm -hmm. it is, a, exactly. it is mm -hmm. not necessary. Hmm. Yes, yes. And also, uh, we could see there's a lot of problems if they all the social workers become the civil servant. So, yeah, yes. that's not the right direction for the future. And also, yeah, there's another question. 
uh, for Professor Zhang Yi. Uh, I think that's a very interesting question, but uh, seems from my computer, the question just disappeared. I will <laughs> just try to remember the question. The, the question, uh, uh, let's see, yes. Okay, ah, the question come back. That's great, it's a miracle. Uh, uh, the question from Ming Hua Chang, uh, that is uh, for Professor Zhang Yi. And also the other panelists are also welcomed to answer this question. The question is, I don't understand why aging population is a serious concern for East Asian countries, because European has been an aging society for a quite a long time with low economic growth, high government diet, and also low social mobility. However, Europe does not have any social unrest or economic crisis caused by aging. So why should we worry about East Asia if Europe, because Europe is a more aged society, so why should we East Asia worry if the Europe is doing quite well? So that is the question for Professor uh, Zhang Yi and also Professor. Uh, yes, uh, uh, very uh, good question. Because you know, uh, the population aging can be the structure of the population. So. Uh, in the European countries, or in the North American countries, I think uh, different uh, aging uh, structure of the population have different political decision and political chance for all of the uh, uh, practice of modernization. Uh, Professor, to, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, your connection seems to me is unstable. What is the here you continue? Uh, other panels? Is it okay? Yeah, it seems better a little bit. Please um, try again. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's a very good question uh, for us to understand that this kind of the chance of the population change or transition. Uh, in countries and in North American countries, uh, uh, even the population age structure we change the people's viewpoint of the political uh, viewpoint. Uh, in European countries, you know, the aging population, they like to be supported by social services and uh, supported by the aging service community. Uh, support or uh, home care or some kind of the uh, 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 community they uh, service care and the social workers care this kind of the service as uh, distributions if the distribution of this kind of the service is okay most of the aging people will feel good and if they have not this kind of the services maybe the, the aging people will feel don't, uh, don't know, okay. And uh, in East uh, Asian countries, maybe Japan do much more better for this kind of the service and the aging institutions, it's all, uh, they work very good. But in China, you know, uh, we, we just facing aging process in recent years. And uh, in coast part of China, the community service is okay. But the West part of China, because of the lack of the financial support, this kind of the service is lack. So uh, I think uh, in European countries, uh, they have a long, long time social transition. But in East Asian countries, this kind of the stage is much more short. They just, uh, uh, just like in Japan, in you know, 50 years or past the four decades, they from uh, agricultural country become uh, industrial country and uh, the industrial first industrial country. 
and uh, in South Korea, it is the same thing. It's a very quickly transition. In China, it's the same thing. In first part of China, most of the big cities they face the first industrialization, but in uh, west part of China, they still are uh, agriculture society. Uh, so I think this is the difference. And uh, uh, in European countries, this they, they really face some risks of aging. They really face uh, in, in, in the world of the politicians their face. Why in, in France, why in the United States, the, the condemn and uh, why in uh, vast part of uh, European countries. The aging population, they like to work, but the young population, uh, their labor risk is much, much lower. In United States, it's the same thing. The aging population like to work, especially in the middle part of the United States. The aging population, they like to work. So this is a very important thing. They, they, they really face some risks. In China, it's the same thing. In nowadays, it's okay, but in the near future, maybe they, they will face some the aging population. They like to uh, make some decisions and do some things. If they, you research some social movements, maybe uh, they will find more evidence to understand this kind of the transition. Okay. Thanks, Professor Zhang. Uh, Professor Zhang just uh, summarized that I think uh, we have to look at the different uh, social strat stratification in both in the uh, East Asia and as well as in the European countries. And also because the social structure changed so fast in East Asia. So even we are facing the aging population, uh, both in the East Asia and also in the West Europe. We are still facing very different challenges. Okay, uh, there is another question for Professor Cogney. Uh, that is, Professor Cogney, uh, the question is for you. The question is from Ji uh, Wei Qian. That is, do you ask respondents whether they want to relocate to other communities. If people concern about the risks of pandemic, they may want to select community to reside. Here is the question. That, yeah. <laughs> the great question. <laughs> and so, um, but I wish, yeah, you had been at the table when we were putting together our questionnaire. We didn't, you know, at the time, I really think that's a great question. At the time, I think we didn't envision that the pandemic would be of such long duration. Oh, many months. So we were putting this questionnaire together in March and April. And I think I, I would just say collectively in our group, we imagined that we would kind of cut, we would come out of the summer and things would open up. Uh, and so we didn't think of it as something that would be such a dramatic kind of life due to the pandemic and circumstance. But I think that's a fabulous question. And actually, I think that's now a question that we'll include in our follow-up where we mm -hmm. sort of are, you know, have this way that's after the pandemic. And we'll ask about changes in residential location, not just changes, uh, but ask about intention or did, you know, mm -hmm. or aspirational. Would people have liked to have moved, mm -hmm. but couldn't for a variety of reasons? So. Thanks for that suggestion. That's great. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you for uh, Professor uh, Cogney. And also there is one question, I think, both uh, for uh, several our panelists. That is, is there a growing need for senior daycare centers in China? If yes, and uh, how are the current one? run or funded? Who run those senior daycare centers and how they get funded? I think several panelists probably have something to say about this question. Okay. Because of one, we answer these questions. Okay. Professor Wen. 
I, I actually don't know about anything um, <laughs> on these topics. Daycare <laughs> and I personally don't want to see more of these kind of things in China. I want to see more Ooh. social service provided okay. for people who are in need of this, but maybe not a senior daycare center um, like you can, you know, younger people can send them to during the daytime. I, I think conceptually speaking, wouldn't you know they want to just uh, stay in their home and you know try to live independently as much as possible with some help, but not mm -hmm. you know in ways of you know really returning to childhood or babyhood okay. that kind of idea. That's just my gut feeling. I don't know. Um, so I want okay. to I want to say that uh, the word daycare center is very confusing mm -hmm. because it actually encompasses many types of um, exactly. community centers. Um, if you think about the ones that are operated by the by the government for what we call Wu Bao, um, the very low income, basically welfare recipients, Di Bao Wu Bao. Those are not very well run and they provide a minimal service. Um, and there are some others that are provided by uh, very um, private entrepreneurs that service the very, very rich. And those actually are very well run and they're not daycare mm -hmm. center in the sense that they're the babies. They actually have all sorts of activities. They take them to cocoa out because if you do survey, I think elderly like to stay at their home as their home but they also like to have during the day social interaction and these exactly. centers are for that purpose and the fundamental question i think for china is the middle group the not very mm -hmm. rich the not very poor one what do you do with them and again is the, i think we, we need to start with the creative thinking of what is the kind of things these old people would like to do when they go to these centers in a way that is meaningful, in a way that they feel that they're still living rather than they're just being looked after like a baby. I, I, that's my, my view is, it's really the nature and the quality of the service. And how is it being funded is, I mean, there are no, some of them are not very expensive. China has a rising middle income class. Some of them can be privately funded. And the, the question what the government needs to do is to regulate the service the quality and the safety of the service and the pricing. Uh, uh, maybe okay. I can start, uh, mm -hmm. do, we have, do we have time? We yeah, have time. we still have time. Yeah, we still have time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Professor yeah. Bort Hoffman uh, tried to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, please. So Hoffman? Professor, Professor Bert Hoffman, Hoffman, no, oh, okay, okay, so maybe okay. I can, maybe I can say something. something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, you know, in China, in China, uh, uh, in rural area, 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 and in the the system, the system to keepers, uh, common life, in rural area. Uh, we know, uh, uh, Wu Bao, Hu, Wu Bao was totally supported by the local government. And uh, in urban area, the senior care in community was, uh, most part of the finance came from government, local government. And uh, some of the finance came from, uh, enterprise. They, they, they call that social enterprise. They, they like to do that. And some of them came from projection uh, supported by social workers. And social workers, they apply some projection and they do the uh, uh, health care. And uh, some restaurants was run by social workers. And uh, uh, if the senior persons uh, just uh, work for minutes, they can find this kind of uh, uh, restaurants and enjoy their lunch and uh, their supper. Uh, but uh, the, the price much more low one. Uh, in the community of Guangzhou, uh, you, you know, uh, they just uh, 
uh, thin RMB, thin RMB yuan to buy this kind of the large, the very, very low one. They can afford this kind of money and they run by the local government and by local, we, 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 we call them community. But this kind of community is not really community. They are uh, some other church community. They run this kind of the, the, the work. Yep, exactly. Uh, I also visit some uh, so-called the senior daycare center, both in Beijing as well as in Guangzhou. Uh, we found out actually that became a uh, community center in one sense because the uh, senior residents, they would like to come together to talk to each other, to play games, to play car games with each other, to play mahjong with each other, and also even to dance together. Some of the senior citizens, they even to start learn some new skills. For example, uh, to try to learn how to uh, draw a paint. This kind of the activities, I, I think that's not just uh, for provide the most basic uh, services such as food and drink, but uh, much more than that, at least in uh, the tier one cities in China, the local government actually provided this kind of the daycare centers that quite different from the, the rural one the, in the we could see in the 1980s or in the 1990s. Okay. Uh, the time is already, we are running out of time. Uh, probably the last one question that is from Eileen Wang. That is, China is going to raise the retirement age in order to address the question of burden of pensions. How do you think the older population in China, uh, either in rural area or in the urban area, would respond to this important policy change? I think this question uh, directs to all the panelists. I think that's the last question. Yeah, uh, maybe I can do it. Because of you, in, in China, the pension system can divide the three parts to working in universities and in the government, it is okay because of their retirement uh, pension uh, is much more uh, good because of last year uh, account it, uh, computed uh, compute and uh, monthly payment may be uh, 4,000 and 500 RMB also. To all of the retirement uh, comes from uh, urban area uh, enterprises workers retirement their average uh, and monthly payment is uh, 3,000 3, and uh, 200 RMB also but for the residents of urban for the residents of area the monthly payment is much more low and maybe just uh, in the course part of China maybe monthly payment is equals uh, 500 RMB also but in the west part of the um, uh, central part of China, it's lower. They just uh, must pay them maybe just uh, 200 also. And in Gansu province, uh, last year visited uh, some aging uh, population uh, uh, families. They said that they just 152 RMB also. So it's quite different between different regions. But the uh, urban it's okay. Most of them feel okay. Okay. So, other panelists? Okay. Yeah, because I cannot see the panelists. So, uh, and also we see, okay, yeah. we come back here. And also we see the other uh, researchers from other panelists uh, come to our a conference. I don't know if they have any question or any comments. I'm I'm actually I'm, sorry I'm actually to sorry to say I have to depart for a, a meeting with our UN campus. In okay. Hong Kong. So okay. I I really enjoyed working with all of you. 
Okay. I think yes, all the, uh, yeah, we, yeah, already the time is up. And thanks uh, very much for every panelist. Thank you. Uh, thanks yes, for thank the you. very interesting and insightful presentations. And also thanks Sorry, for- Sorry, I didn't mean the, to shut down. Yeah, but uh, we should- Yes, I can share. Uh, and here, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, and I think the time is up. Okay. Yeah, because the other yeah. the uh, the other organizer organizers and <laughs> other researchers they have other conference to attend, and also that's just okay. one part of the one panel of our whole conference. Okay, thanks again, and also thanks very much for all the staffs behind the scene. They provided the wonderful organization of this fascinating conference. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.